Hello and a very warm welcome from wonderful Wadham in the heart of Croydon. It's really great to have you with us today and especially if you're watching us for the first time. We pray that God will really bless you richly as you join with us. We're anticipating a great time this morning as we worship our Lord and listen to teaching from his word. This week, uh, Chaz Woods is going to be speaking on the subject of where is God in a coronavirus word, world, very practical, and how should we behave as Christians at this time. On Wednesday, he's going to be doing a follow up talk on Facebook and on our website, going into the subject in more detail. So we commend that to you. Before that, let me just briefly refer you to our weekly newsletter, Lifelines, on, Lifelines Online, where you'll find loads of information on prayer meetings, on children's activities, on youth activities, and how you can keep in touch with folk. Uh, there's also details about how you can give to support the ministry here at New Life. Nothing more to add to that except to say that we are so grateful for your faithful and generous giving. And on a personal note, I'd be grateful if you could designate some of your giving to Ian James Ministries because my backup helicopter desperately needs a service. I know I can rely on you. Our online services have now been going for four months. It's hard to believe, isn't it? And we trust they've really been a blessing to you. But, you know, church is really about greeting and meeting and interacting with people face to face in person, isn't it? So we've got a dedicated team who are working on how we can bring that about while, of course, observing all the government guidelines to ensure everyone is safe. Now, as part of that process, we're now going to have an update about our gradual return to small group meetings. And that's going to be followed by a short video from Dave Bryars, where he'll be talking about our forthcoming Alpha course online. So please check this out now. How's it been today? It's been really lovely today. Um, we've been blessed with good weather, but it's just so lovely to be able to see my church family in 3D. Lovely to have come out in the open air, and God's given us the sun. Today's been excellent. It's been really good. Um, for you know, about 13 weeks now, I've been dying to get together with my uh, brothers and sisters, and today it's just been fantastic. It's been a great outdoors. And not only that, for us to worship together, you know, so yeah, fantastic. Good news, church. We are starting a new Alpha Online course on Tuesday, the 11th of August. This Alpha Online course has seven sessions. Each one allows for open conversation and exploration of the Christian faith in a relaxed, non-judgmental discussion. And we want to encourage you to invite someone, someone you know, a friend, a neighbour, a family member, anyone you would love for them to come to see and know Jesus. And I want to encourage you that inviting someone couldn't be easier. There are two easy steps. The first step is to send them a link to the invitation video. This is a one minute compilation of people asking questions about life and it ends with an invitation to join an Alpha online. 
Now we've already messaged you, if your number's on our database, we've already messaged you a link to this video and all you would need to do is forward it to someone that you wanna invite. There's also a link to this invitation video in Lifelines. So you can copy and paste it there and email it to someone you know. If they do show interest, then the second step is to send them a link to register online. Again, we've already messaged this to your phone and there's a link in Lifelines. This registration form just takes them through to somewhere where they can put their name and their email and register their place on the course or if they're not sure yet, they can register interest and their desire to know more. And then someone on the team can get in touch with them and encourage them to come. That is it, two easy steps. Send the invitation video, send the registration form. That is it. Our hope is that God will use this Alpha Online to reach into people's homes, into people's lives, and be a way in which we can communicate the hope of the gospel that we have and that people will come to know Jesus. I encourage you, church, be praying. Who could you invite? Thank you very much for that. Uh, we appreciate it. And God bless you in all you're trying to do. Now, before I hand over to our worship team led by James and to Chaz, I just want to pray briefly that God would really meet with us today. Father, we're so glad that despite pandemics and everything else, we're still able to meet together, even if online, worship you and listen to your word. We pray, Lord, for our government, with all the challenges they face, that, Lord, you will give them wisdom as they seek to bring us out of lockdown. We pray for the group at New Life who are seeking to do the same thing with relation to our church activities and our fellowship. Lord, we thank you that not even a pandemic can stop you working. And Lord, uh, we pray that you will bless your church at this time, that you will bless New Life at this time, that Lord, you will move powerfully in the lives of everyone associated with our fellowship in the areas of their health, their work, their finances, their family, whatever it may be. And now, Lord, Lord we're going to devote this time to you. We're going to focus on you. We're going to worship you in spirit and in truth. We're going to listen to your word. Lord, we pray that you will meet with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just sing out our praises to God. Father, we love you. We adore you. You're worthy of us getting up this morning and coming together to, um, to join with the rest of the saints, albeit apart, but together in spirit. So, Father God, we just welcome you. Amen. Church, let's just take a minute before we actually sing a song together. Let's just focus our hearts on him let's just welcome the holy spirit into our homes just sing out in tongues sing out in whatever language come holy spirit this morning we praise your name Father, we love you. You are so good to us. And you're protecting us. We love you. 
love your presence. Thank you. And I will offer up my life in spirit and truth. I'm pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you. And in surrender I must bring my every part and Lord receive the sacrifice of a broken heart and I will offer up my life spirit and truth pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you and in surrender I must give my every part Receive a sacrifice of a broken heart. So, Jesus, what can I give? And what can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king? Savior, what can be said? And what can be sung as a praise of your name? For the things you have done And all my words could not tell Not even in part And of the debt of love that is owed By this thankful heart of my every breath for you pay the great cost and giving up your life to death even death on the cross and you took all my shame away and there defeated my sin you've opened up the gates of hell and have beckoned me in so Jesus what can I give can I bring to so faithful a friend, to so loving a king, Savior, what can be said, what can be sung, and as a praise of your name, for the things you have done, so Jesus, what can I give, what can I bring, to so faithful friend, to so loving a king, and Savior, what can be said, what can be sung, as a praise of your name, for the things you have done, and all my words could not tell, not even in part, of the dead of by this thankful heart and all my words could not tell not even in part and of the debt of love that is owed by this thankful heart by this thankful heart By this thankful heart, no, my words could not tell, not even in part, of the debt of love that is owed by this thankful heart. We love you, Father. We love your spirit. We love you, Jesus. And Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Comfort this 
this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence. Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood our Our hearts long to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. And to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live to worship you. To worship, to worship you, I live. To worship you, I live, I live. To worship you, I live. To worship you, I live. I live to worship you. Oh, oh, oh. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within to the way things are. You're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about. It's all about you, Jesus. And I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to heart. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. King of endless word, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours and every single breath I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper you search much deeper within to the way things are you're looking into my heart And I'm coming back to the heart of worship When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus And I'm 
sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Why don't we just take a moment just to reflect? Maybe we need to search our hearts. And if there's anything in there recently that has been making life anything other than a life of sacrifice to our God, a life of worship to our King, maybe there's some stuff you need to deal with now. Just lay at the feet of Jesus. Just give it to Him. Ask for forgiveness if you need to. And ask God just to wash you clean to change your heart, to change your mind. If that's what he needs to do, just give it all to him. We lay it all down at your feet, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you have taken all of our sin upon yourself on that cross. And we thank you that you have died for our sins. You have died for our freedom. And you have died that we might have eternal life with you. We thank you, Father. Amen. Hello, New Life. It's great to be with you virtually again today. And uh, we've got two videos for you this week. One is the one I'm doing today on Sunday, and there's one going out later in the week as well, which is a sort of extra to this and gives you more theological background. So you can tune into that if you like during the week. Let's pray, and then we're going to look at this subject together. Yeah, Father God, we just thank you for your love for us. We thank you you're here with us in our homes and also with me as I'm speaking. And as we think about the subject today of where are you, God, in a coronavirus world, where people ask that question with pain, some people ask it with deep searching, we pray, Lord, that you would speak through your word today, that you'd reveal to us exactly where you are and how you're working, that you'd fill us with your hope, you'd fill us with courage, you'd fill us with your good news, and that we can take it out into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. So the subject I want to look at today is where is God in a coronavirus world? It's a question many people are asking, both Christians and non-Christians. Is he in lockdown? Is he in quarantine? Why doesn't he act? Doesn't he care about our situation? These are real questions, and the Bible does have answers. And we need to have answers for our friends, for our family, for our work colleagues, for those who are seeking and really want to know Jesus and hope that he is there for them. And I want to give you today one thing that God won't do until he has to, one thing he has done, three things he is doing now, and one thing he will do in the future. So first of all, one thing God won't do until he has to. The coronavirus, in my opinion, is not from God. Ultimately, it's from man and the enemy. And we'll look at that in the notes today and more deeply on Wednesday. But why won't God stop it then? Often we want God to be like Superman for us, stopping all evil and injustice happening in the world by his superpower. Think about those Marvel agents, you know, Iron Man, a superhero, stops the nuclear missile and diverts it and rescues humanity. 
And kind of we'd like God to be like that, intervening in the world, coming in and showing his superpower. But why doesn't God do that? Some think because of that, God is not here or he doesn't care. But there is another reason, a deeper reason. Just think for a moment, what else would you like God to stop? Would you like him to stop the war in Syria, Yemen, and in other parts of the world? Would you like him to stop all the injustice in the world? Nelson Mandela said, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persist in our world, none of us can truly rest. But it's not just international problems. What about domestic abuse? We'd all want to see that stopped. But that comes right into our own homes and families. It's getting a bit closer, isn't it? It's not just out there in the world. It's in us, in our families. And what about the wrong things that I do, that you do? If we're really honest, we all contribute to the wrong that's in the world. G.K. Chesterton said this. Somebody wrote into the newspaper complaining about all the evils in the 20th century. And they said, what's wrong with the world? And he simply wrote back this simple answer. What's wrong with the world? I am. Just those two words. I am what's wrong with the world. If God was going to stop all the evil and injustice in the world, yes, he'd have to stop those big things, but he'd actually have to stop me as well. He will stop the world one day, and he will judge the living and the dead, but not until he has to. Jesus told a parable that explains this very carefully and simply. In Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30, it says this. It says that a man came and he sowed good seed into the soil and up was in order to get a good harvest. But then he came back later and his worker said, in the midst of all the wheat, there was weeds growing up as well that had been deliberately sown by an enemy. And Jesus said in this parable, he said, the people came to him and said, shall we pull up all the weeds? And the master said, no, don't pull up the weeds, because if you do, you'll pull up the wheat as well. Leave it there until the harvest. We'll harvest it all, and then we'll sort out the weeds and the wheat. And this, in this parable, Jesus is giving us a story of what the world is like. The world is full of good things, we see the wheat there, we see the good things in humanity, but we also see the weeds, we see the damage, we see the evil and the wrong things up there. But Jesus says, leave it there until the harvest, because it's mixed in together. Leave it to the harvest, and then it will be sorted out. Jesus said it in another way. He said, don't be alarmed. In the last days, there will be wars, there'll be famine, there will be pestilence. He told us in advance that these things will happen. And he told us and said, don't be alarmed at the same time. He said, don't be anxious about these things. They're part of how this world is. This world is broken and there's a mixture of good and evil. And God understands that. But he won't just intervene with his superpower until he has to. So that's the one thing he won't do until he has to. He won't come in and just judge the earth. And he has a better way. There is one thing that God has done. Before Jesus came, God promised through centuries and many different prophets to send a rescuer, a Messiah. And God chose not to defeat by his superpower, but another way altogether. It's not always the way we would look for, and so we might miss God. And if you're looking for him just to come in his superpower, then you'll probably miss him. But look in another place, because God comes in humility And he comes in sacrificial love. Read this in Isaiah 53, verse 3 to 5. This is speaking 500 years before Jesus came, speaking of a rescuer who would come. But instead of being like a superpower, he comes like this. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. God doesn't defeat by his superpower. He defeats through sacrificial love. Jesus took the sin of the world and the punishment you and I deserve by dying on the cross in our place. And by rising from the dead, Jesus defeated our accuser, Satan, and defeated the power of sin and death. Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. God is not working in Old Testament ways any longer. He is working through Jesus. He's given all authority to the Son. He's given all judgment to the Son. And God has chosen in his wisdom to work through Jesus to redeem and rescue the world. John 3 verse 16 and 17 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in an order that the world might be saved through him. He came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Sacrificial love offers us a choice. Superpower gives you no choice. I just take over, I stop you, I stop the evil, you have to stop as well. But sacrificial love takes the pain onto itself and gives us the option to reject or accept what's being offered. We call it faith. It means to put your trust in God and to accept what he's done. So this is the one thing that God has done for us, is through Jesus Christ, he's taken our sin, he's taken our judgment, he's taken the evil of this world on himself, he's defeated it and gives us the option to choose love and choose his way. But you might say, oh, well, that's a long time ago. That's 2,000 years ago. What's he doing now? Are you just saying, well, I've just got to look back to that. I wasn't there then. I can't see it. How can I know that that's for me? Well, I want to give you three things that God is doing in this world now. The first thing is that God brings the good news of the kingdom. When Jesus came, he came proclaiming good news that God's kingdom had arrived. We're used to the kingdom of this world. We're used to what this world is like. And when problems happen, we shrug our shoulders because, well, that's normal for this world. But Jesus came to bring a different kingdom. He came bringing a kingdom of healing the sick, casting out demons, and proclaiming forgiveness and everlasting life to people who believed on him. This is the kingdom. And Jesus offers us this kingdom. And he said this, This gospel of the kingdom shall be proclaimed in all the earth, and then, after that, the end will come. Matthew 24, verse 14. His rule, his full rule will come. So Jesus proclaimed, demonstrated healing and deliverance. And I just want to share a video testimony now of Pastor Lee. He was very ill with COVID-19. He was taken into hospital. He thought at first he'd be in for a couple of days. He didn't even take his phone with him. He thought he'd be back quickly. But it turned it, days turned into weeks. And he was in a very, very serious condition to the point he thought he was going to die. And this video now is taken from just shortly after he was dismissed home from hospital and listen to him in his own words. So let's watch this video now. I remember in one of the nights, there was two nights particularly in the hospital when I honestly didn't know whether I would make it or not. I was under incredible pressure and I thought I was moments away from ending up on a ventilator and the nurses uh, and the doctors had hit me with all sorts of things and uh, got drips up and, and all that they needed to do. But I remember those nights particularly <clears throat> really crying out to the Lord and, and asking him to help me and asking him to somehow encourage my heart, somehow strengthen me 
even supernaturally just do something that would encourage me and bring me through. And I remember the next day, I think it was the Monday or the Tuesday, and uh, I had a night from hell. <laughs> and that day, and that morning, when no one else, and you got to understand this in, in the isolation ward, when no one else can get in, when no one else, no pastor, no friend, no family members, when no one else was allowed in, God sent a cleaner. And all of a sudden this cleaner had come in, and there had been cleaners in before this, but this cleaner had come in, and he was like a ray of sunshine. And he began to chat to me, and he asked me how I was. And he began to talk to me and say to me <clears throat> about about hanging in there. And then we got chatting and we got talking, and he and he turned around and he, and and he said to me that he was a missionary in Nigeria for 14 years. And he began to tell me how God had saved many many souls through his ministry. And how God had used him over the years to reach people. And here he is, now a cleaner. And he's encouraging my heart. And he's telling me about souls and about the love of Jesus and the love of God. And I'm just sitting going, wow. And the soul was encouraged as I listened to him talk about how Jesus had used his life to rescue the souls of men and how he had travelled. And then just this last couple of years, he had found himself back home in Northern Ireland. And, and folks, when God, when God needs to reach you, he knows exactly who is the right person. And in that moment of time, it was a cleaner. No one else could get in. God sent a cleaner. And you know what was incredible? He left that day and then he says this as he stood at the door. He says, son, can I pray for you? And I says, absolutely. And as he began to pray at the door, he couldn't touch me. <clears throat> as he began to pray at the door, he began to ask God the Holy Ghost to visit me. He began to ask God to heal my body and touch my lungs. He stood at that doorway and he pleaded with God Almighty to spur my life and to continue to use me. And then he left. And what was incredible was that after he left, <clears throat> he periodically would walk past my window and give me a thumbs up. And then that night, I remember, I started to turn around. Could it have been the prayer of a cleaner? I don't know. The Bible talks about a, ferv a righteous man, a feeling in prayer. And that night, I began to desire a packet of prawn cocktail crisps, potato. And I asked the Lord, because no one could get to me. And I says, Lord, is it possible that you could get me a packet of prawn cocktail crisps and a tin of Coke? Because that night I began to turn. And as I, that night, lay and just asked that question, I says, Lord, I'd love a packet of prawn cocktail. The next day, the next morning, the cleaner came. And he brought in a bag. And in that bag was two oranges, ten of Coke, and a packet of prawn cocktail crisps. Tito, don't tell me that God doesn't know. God knows our every need. He knows every desire. And he just passed the bag through the door. He, he couldn't come in. And he just says, it's a gift from the Lord. 
So we can see in Lee's video, his testimony, and you can see the emotion that was on his face there, the tears in his eyes, that God does work in this world. And sometimes it's not very visible to people outside, but we can see it, and we know that it's true, and we know that he's touched us. And God's kingdom has invaded the earth through Jesus Christ. But there is a clash of kingdoms. There's the kingdom of this world, ruled by the enemy, by Satan, and there's the kingdom uh, of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand what the Bible says. The whole world lies under the power of the evil one. The coronavirus is not from God. God is working through Jesus. The coronavirus is not what Jesus would do. Jesus saw sickness as an enemy, and he always cast it out. He never uh, caused anybody to be sick. And he wept when people were ill or when they died. The cause of the coronavirus is very likely to be mankind's misuse of the world, and there's evidence being found for that, and I've come on to that in my second talk. And if you want to explore that a bit further, then tune in uh, when it's uh, put out later onto Facebook. So the first thing is God is bringing good news of the kingdom into the world, and it's tangible. It comes not with just words, but with power, healing the sick, and casting out demons. But there's a second thing that God is doing. God is also reconciling all things to himself. The kingdom is not just spiritual, but it's also social transformation. In Luke chapter 4, where Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal the sick, to bind up the brokenhearted, he also said it's to li bring liberty to the oppressed. And Favor, the year of favor, year of God's jubilee, which in the Old Testament meant emancipating people from any kind of bondage they were under. God is working in Jesus Christ to reconcile all things to himself. And not only that, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Let me read to you 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18 and 19. And this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled, to God. So God sees the enemy, uh, sees the world at being at war with himself, and he wants to reconcile the world to himself, and he wants to bring justice into the world. Micah 6 verse 8 says this, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. We are to bring justice into the world. Jesus said we are salt and light. We are to transform the world just as salt transforms a meal or as light transforms a dark room. We are to bring transformation. And that's not just spiritual, that is actual. Jesus said, if you give a cup of water in my name, God will not forget that. If you visit those who are in prison, if you take care of the orphans, this is what God has required us to do, to act with justice, not just to pray justice, but to act with justice. Where can we bring justice? We can bring justice for the poor. With the African Child Trust, you can support that, or you could even go with them to help in some way. There's the Christians Against Poverty cap in our church, and there's other activities, both inside this church and within other churches across this country and around the world. You can act by going. For some of you, maybe your response to the coronavirus is to leave your ordinary day job and to go somewhere in the world where you can make a difference because God might call you specifically to do that. But you can also act if you stay here in an ordinary work with your finances, with your time, to get involved in things like CAP and in ACT and in other kind of Christian activities to help the poor. We can also bring justice to the oppressed. Jennifer Graham, uh, the sister-in-law of Barbara Graham, 
when she saw all that was happening about racial injustice in America and the terrible incident with George Floyd. She felt so moved that she felt she had to do something. She prayed about it and she wrote a poem and she felt really inspired to write this poem. She wrote so inspired she felt that she wrote it in half an hour. And she's going to read this poem for you now. And uh, so let's watch the video together of the poem called Let Us Stand. Let us stand shoulder to shoulder. Let us walk side by side. Let us not be divided. Let us in God abide. Let us all come together. Let us fight the good fight. Let us combat the evil. Let us all unite. Let's speak up for each other. Let us right the wrongs. Let us not be silent. Let us stand and be strong. Let us call out the evil that is hidden in plain sight and corrupting the people for their evil delight. Let us campaign for justice, for our laws and our rights. Let us not lose this moment. Let us focus our sight. Let us speak to the strongholds that they have to come down. They're not working for us. No righteousness can be found. Let us cover each other with love. Let us partner with truth. Train ourselves and our children and save our black youth. Teach the way of God's love, effective, robust and true. Keep humanity victorious. Banish the inhumane few. For George Floyd's life, the world has been shaken. The culmination of thousands of black lives viciously taken. May the presence of evil be squashed by great love, suffocated under masks of schemes, lies and cover-up gloves. COVID-19 has ravaged and devoured its prey, but your end will be soon. Ignorance can no longer stay. Let us work shoulder to shoulder and seize the day. Racism has been uncovered. People, open your eyes. Grasp the hope and the future. So we can all rise. Let's embrace black and white and the colours within. Let us bring forth forgiveness. Let us learn from the past. Let us be good to each other. Let's build trust. Amen? Crush the enemy of all. Let us all breathe again. So in Christ, we are to bring justice to the world. We are to do something to get involved. We are to bring justice to the oppressed. In Christ, because we're all made in God's image, there is no black or white. We are all one in Christ. But in the world... There is black and white. Blacks experience the injustice on a daily basis, even very sadly at times in the church. And so we, especially the white majority, need to stand for justice and equality to bring the kingdom. The challenge is sometimes how should we act? What can we do? What's the right kind of response? What's the right kind of activity? Put it simply, let's act in Christ-like ways. Remembering Jesus died on the cross for us. Remembering that he cared for the poor. He wept with those who wept. He washed the disciples' feet. Let's act in Christ-like ways. Let's have humility and let's bring justice. And let's act for justice everywhere you have opportunity. Every little act of justice makes a difference where you are in your workplace, in your home, in your family, in your friendships, even in your private conversations. Let's act for justice. Let's live as Jesus has shown us to live, who, by the way, wasn't white or (laughs) blue-eyed. He was Middle Eastern and probably living as a carpenter, probably on the dark side of things. So let's act together.
let us stand as one. So the first two ways uh, God works in the world now, he brings good news through the kingdom, healing the sick, preaching good news of forgiveness. Secondly, he reconciling us to God and bringing justice in this world through his church. And thirdly, God comforts us in our sorrows. We do live in a world of wheat and weeds. We are in a spiritual battle and there is suffering, there is casualties in this world. We heard the testimony of Pastor Lee and how God intervened in his situation. But I could also give you testimonies of people who died trusting God. They are equally known and loved by God. And how do we understand all these things? Often we're only left with questions and pain. But the good thing is that we can bring both our pain and our questions to God. Psalm 13, you might like to read the whole psalm, but I'll just read the first verse for the sake of time. Psalm 13, it says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? And this is a real prayer from the heart, isn't it? And it's great to know in the Bible it's okay to ask those kind of questions and just talk about your pain to God. But at the end of Psalm 13, he says, But I have trusted in your steadfast love, and my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And what I believe God wants to show us is if we can understand God as a God of the sacrificial love, the God who in the picture in Revelation is the lamb that was slain, And that's how he moves through the book of Revelation, which is really a picture of the last times. It's a lamb that was slain. It's not a lion going around trouncing his enemies. It's a lamb that's been slain. That is our God. That is where you will find God, in the lamb that was slain. Look for him there and you'll find him. You know, we can either turn from God in our pain or we can turn to God in our pain. Psalm 13 helps us to turn to him in our pain. Writing a poem like Jennifer wrote is another way of taking our pain to God. You might like to write down a poem of your own or a song of your own, just for your own use, or you can share it with others if you wanted to. But it can help you to grieve. And when we trust in God, he also strengthens us through suffering to make us more like Christ. In 1 Peter 1 verse 6 and seven. Through our trials, we get refined in the fire and will come forth as gold. And we can endure with hope, for there is one thing that God will do. This world as we know it is full of pain and injustice. Romans 8 verse 19 to 25 says that even creation groans with suffering itself. It's like the whole of creation itself is in pain and affliction, almost like in uh, childbirth. But the Bible says that God will return in Christ Jesus to bring justice and renewal to the earth. Revelation 21, verse 3 and 4, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning or crying, pain any more, for the former things have passed away. We should all strive for justice and equality in this world. We shouldn't live passively just waiting for the next one, because God has given us the job of reconciliation through the church with Jesus. But even if it doesn't happen in our lifetime, and for some it hasn't happened in their lifetime, God will bring it at the end. And the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So where is God in a coronavirus world? He's on the cross, dying in our place. Where is God in a coronavirus world? He's bringing the good news of the kingdom, healing the sick, taking care of the poor, even raising the dead? Where is God working through the church in the tough places of the world where there's injustice, poverty, violence? He's working through the church to reconcile all things to himself as we even love our enemies. 
Where is God in a coronavirus world? He is comforting us in our pain and he giving us a sure and certain hope for the future. So as we go out into the world this week and live in this coronavirus world with our face masks on if we have to, <laughs> let's proclaim and demonstrate the good news. Let's proclaim the good news of a God who loves us sacrificially as we can see in the face of Jesus. Let's demonstrate the good news by praying for the sick and setting the captives free. Let us live and act for justice and equality in our small everyday conversations, in our big decisions at work that affect justice and equality. Let's comfort and strengthen the suffering and let's be steadfast knowing that our hope is not in vain. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you that when we look to you, we see you in the face of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, you are the exact representation of the Father. If we've seen you, Jesus, we have seen what the Father's like. We ask you to break down our, all our wrong thinking about you. Lord, would you heal our hearts that we would understand, even through the pain, that you are a God of love and you're at work in this world. I pray that you would help us this week to go out and pro proclaim the good news and to demonstrate the good news that your kingdom is here and at work amongst us in a broken world. Strengthen us and give us courage to live and act for justice and equality. Help us to comfort the dying and the ill and the grieving and strengthen them in their suffering and cause us all to be steadfast in hope. I pray, Father, as we go out into this week, I say, receive the Holy Spirit who goes with you into this hurting world to bring peace and healing and justice. In Jesus' name, amen.